Okay, this is a screencast to take you through the analysis of covariance uh, example that we'll be going through in class tomorrow, Monday, whatever tomorrow's date is, in this strange world we live in, uh, which will be the 27th. So um, I had a little bit of a choking fit on Friday, and my voice is a little rough as a result of it, so I'll try and get all the way through this. Um, so first thing, you obviously need to make sure that you're in the correct working directory. Uh, you're ultimately going to need the ANCOVA example uh, data file that is on the Moodle site. You need a number of different packages to go through this, some of which you have not probably installed yet. On your computer, for example, Compute ES and FX, as well as the HH package, uh, these are all packages that allow you to do certain things that that you wouldn't necessarily normally want to do, but but I needed them for this particular demonstration. In the case of compute ES and effects, you do want those because you, you want to be able to estimate effect sizes in this script. So uh, load in the data file. And in this case the data <coughs> the data are um, from an experiment where somebody was interested in the memory gains that are made by people who are taking a placebo versus memory gains of some of a group of people who are on a type of drug that is supposed to enhance memory. And because memory is also related to intelligence, you might have a covariate that is your IQ score on an IQ test. And so uh, you have the response variable, which is the memory score, whatever that is, and then you have the IQ uh, value for each individual, five individuals in the placebo group and five individuals in the drug group. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that, of course, you're reading your, your classification factor group as a factor, and you are. And then one of the other things that, that I just oftentimes like to do early on is get a feel for, for the data. So I'm just going to run summary SE here on the measured variable score and the group variable group. There are other ways of doing this. Uh, this is just the way that I, I choose to do this. You see that you have five uh, observations in each group, and uh, you see that the score has an average score of 13.8 and 8.36 for drug and placebo, respectively. The confidence interval is relatively large. Um, so before we learned about analysis of covariance, if you were given these data, you would have just looked at score as it varies by placebo versus drug, and you would have gotten an answer. And when you run that, you see that uh, you do get an answer, and it does seem that the, the group variable has a significant effect on one's memory score. But you'll also see that the sum of squares is relatively small for a group and relatively large for the residual sum of the squares. Well, that's because um, when we do an ANOVA on this, we aren't accounting for the fact that these things may be correlated with a covariate, the independent, uh, the, the uh, IQ score. And so if we want to know what the means are of these things, we can get it uh, to basically give us the fitted values for the predicted model and you see that for the first five observations, it's 8.36 because that was the placebo group. For the second five values, it is 13.8. And uh, what we can do with this then is we can add those as a column that I'm calling y hat to the predicted um, variable line in the data frame. And so now we have the, the original data frame, but then we also have this last column called y hat, which is just the mean in an ANOVA sense of, of placebo and a mean of drug. Then we can basically go through and, and plot this. And so what I'm going to plot here is I'm going to plot IQ score versus memory score, and I'm going to color it by group, in this case, the placebo versus drug group. And there are a bunch of lines here that I have, that I have hidden, that I have I've commented out, because I want them to appear here in a few minutes. But when we do this, one of the things that we see is that um, 
the data appear to be correlated. As IQ goes up, memory score goes up. And it also appears that the drug group is probably larger than the placebo group. <clears throat> but the other thing that you see is that there is a lot of variation in memory score that is not due to simply variation in memory score. It's variation that is due to the correlation between memory score and IQ. <clears throat> if you just ran an ANOVA on this, uh, you would see a lot of variation within the drug group, a lot of variation within the placebo group. But because you've measured a covariate, in this case IQ, you can examine whether or not that relationship between IQ and memory score is actually inflating your within sample variance. So um, you can change colors on these things. Here's a little piece of code that I haven't shown you before but it tells you uh, what the different colors are that are being used. Um, so shape, size, stroke, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, what color is being coded for for all of these things. Uh, it's, when I'm trying to change colors on things, I, I kind of sometimes will want to know what colors things are. So now we can make a new plot. And on this new plot, we're going to actually just um, just to basically plot um, what the um, well, let's see what does it give us? Oh, yeah, it's just going to plot what the means are, and then it's going to plot the the standard residuals from the mean. So uh, let's assume that IQ you had no knowledge of IQ, and you just had drug versus placebo, and looking at how memory score responds you would see that there are relatively high residuals uh, that are in these data, the residual being the distance between the mean and the actual value of, of an observation. So I have here in the script, so there is a lot of residual variation due to correlation of the response variable with the covariate. This is quantified in the mean squared residual, or some squared residual from the ANOVA. That should really be some squared residual uh, from the ANOVA. Uh, table that we generated earlier, so let's go back and regenerate this ANOVA, where we see all of this sum square residual, the 73.03 down here, a lot of that residual variation is variation due to this regression between memory score and IQ. So wouldn't it be nice if we could look at this and control for that variation, control for that covariation between memory score and IQ. And so uh, this next plot basically shows you the same data, but in this case it shows the regression lines for both of those both of those things. And you can see that if you could use the regression model to correct for the correlation between memory score and IQ, you would see that your overall residual values would be lower if you could do that. So thankfully, we can do that. And what we do is we change this, um, this analysis of variance script up here that's a linear model where you just have score and group. And you add to that score tilde group plus IQ. And when you do this, it does an analysis of covariance. And there is some variation that is due to group, but there is some systematic variation that is due to IQ and there is also residual variation. And when you add 52.12 to 20.91, what you get is you get 73.03. So some of the variation that was in sum squares residual now resides in the sum of squares due to IQ. And so you reduce your overall residual value, which then makes testing your main effect, which is the memory score, more powerful, you see that the p-value has gone down from 0 0.02 to 0 0.001 because you have controlled for this, um, this inflation of residual variation that was due to the correlation with IQ. So now we can get the fitted values um, as a result of this, and um, you can see that these values all now vary because um, they are the points on the line. We can add those fitted line values to the data frame, y hat, linear model, and what we see is, is these 
values here. So obviously, observation number three is the one that is way down here. And so um, we can then add these fitted values to the whole thing. And so what we've what we've done now is we've we've basically used the analysis of covariance to give us some fitted values. So this is analysis analysis two is the is the analysis of covariance that we ran up here. It's giving us the fitted values, and then we're subtracting the fitted values from the means, or are adding the fitted values to the means in order to get these residuals. But one of the things that you notice is that this line doesn't match up with the endpoints of the residuals. And the reason that this is the case is that one of the assumptions of an analysis of covariance, which is what analysis two is in this script, one of the assumptions is that the slope value of the two regressions is the same. And the way R does this is it actually takes those slope values and uh, averages them and forces them to be the same. And so when we plot the actual regressions that are not the same, you see that the, that the slopes don't match up with the ends of the residuals like they should. So what we need to do then is basically um, get the predicted line from the, the analysis that we see here that in plot five, in the uh, in the, the data portion of this, we are getting the predicted values from the predicted values predicted from analysis two, and that's going to give us the line that the analysis of covariance is using. And as a result of that manipulation, now we see two regression lines that are parallel with one another, and those regression lines match up with the residual variation. So now you see that the residual variation is relatively low around the placebo, it's relatively low around the drug, but generally speaking, the y-intercept looks to be much higher than for drug than the y-intercept for placebo is. So one of the things, one of the ways of thinking about what an analysis of covariance does is an analysis of covariance is going to basically figure out what the grand mean of IQ is which in this case is um, 11.08. Sorry, no, not a score. Mean of IQ is 115.2. 115.2, so right about there. It's going to basically run a line up through these data points, and then it's going to move all of these data points for drug either down or up parallel to their slope to reside here at 115.2. And uh, when it does that, so here's what that, here's where the grand mean lies. And so it's going to drag this one down to about here. It's gonna drag this one about up to right there. It's gonna drag this one down to here. Once again, parallel to the slope. It's going to drag this one down to about here and it's going to drag this one down to about here. Basically, these new data points will, or the old data points will now be centered on the mean of memory score for drug, and they will deviate from that by whatever their original residual value was from the line. So knowing this, we can calculate what the adjusted means are. And uh, we use the effects uh, package to basically calculate the effect size, and it does a bunch of other things, but among the things that it does is it will give us the adjusted means. And so the adjusted mean for drug is 12.29, and placebo is 9.86. And so it's adjusted down for drug, and it's adjusted up for placebo. If you don't believe me, we can go back to the original summary SE that was up here at the very top uh, at the beginning of all of this and the values were 13.8 and 9.36. So um, placebo got adjusted upward and drug got adjusted downward. Did 
many if you've ever done this. Now I'm going to here. Go back up. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So what we want to do is let's recreate plot six. So plot six is here. So we can go and we can get the new adjusted means. Now, one of the things that you can do when you get this thing right here, any output that you get in R, so I've called running, it says basically give me the effects of group from analysis two. Analysis two is the analysis of covariance, not the analysis of variance. So I'm basically asking what's the effect sizes. And it gives us the mean, and it gives us the lower limit of the confidence interval and the upper limit of the confidence interval. Because I've named that add adjusted mean, ADJ mean, I can get the summary of it, but then I can also say, I want you to call that, I want you to make that thing X. And so when I do this, I've basically just taken an object that is output from R and converted it into an object that I can now manipulate. So I can look at X effect, I can look at X lower, and I can look at X upper by treating this now as a data frame, x dollar sign effect, x dollar sign lower. Now as a result of that, I can basically plot the adjusted means, which is the effect, and I can plot the upper and lower confidence intervals by basically um, putting the confidence intervals into here. Where did I do that? Oh, I'm just using it as raw data. So I'm, I'm actually just gonna be making some, some segments in this section right here to do that. So, um, oh crud, nope. I didn't wanna run a single line. I want to run this entire plot. So what I've done in this plot is I've just basically left the common common regression with the residual values, and I've now plotted what is the adjusted mean of memory score for placebo and the adjusted mean of what is the memory score of the drug. Those are the means, those are the intercepts of the predicted values, the, the equation of the line, where the line crosses the grand mean. So you can take these things that you've, that you've just done, you can take them out, of this whole thing, and you can basically create a new confidence interval plot where you're basically adding, you're basically building a data frame up from, from scratch where you have treatment, it's gonna be either drug or placebo. The uh, response variable is going to be the effect. Uh, CI is the effect minus the lower, and then we've given our, our little data frame row names. So when we run that, it gives you a treatment value, a response value, and a width of the confidence interval for uh, these two things. Um, as it turns out, those are strangely exactly the same. I hadn't ever noticed that. And then from this, you can then plot the adjusted means. And so these adjusted means, this one is centered at 12.38 at or whatever it was a minute ago, or 12.29. This one is centered at 9.86. And then you have confidence intervals that go up to slightly more than 14 and slightly more than 10, um, around 12 and around 8 for the placebo. But you can also do this for the unadjusted means, which are just the the ones that you did way back at the very beginning. So we can make a plot for the unadjusted means. And what you find here is that the means is higher for drug and lower for placebo, but also the confidence intervals are much wider. And the reason that the confidence intervals are much wider is because you're not removing the effect of the regression between memory score and IQ. And so when you run a 
when you run analysis one, you have this large value of residual. And when you do the same thing with analysis two, which is the analysis of covariance version of this analysis, um, you see that the sum of the squares due to the main effect hasn't changed, but the sum of the squares residual has been reduced. The sum of squares residual that was 73.03 is now 20.91. And the, the reason that this is reduced is because some of the variation in the response variable due to group is actually due to variation due to regression. And that's a significant amount of variation. And if once again, if you add 52.12 to 20.91, it will equal 73.03. So it's basically partitioning some of the residual variation into variation that is due to regression. And um, I think that's probably enough for you to wrap your heads around for now. Uh, we're going to go through this uh, Monday in class uh, just to make that, sure that everybody is on board with it. And um, I think that's it for today. All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow.